Hi everyone, welcome to the meetup. I'm Martin Goodson um, from Evolution AI, the sponsors of the meetup. And today we have Brendan Lake speaking with us again. So some of you may have been present three years ago when Brendan gave a really fantastic talk to us um, back then. Uh, just looked today and saw uh, his, the recording of that talk was really well received on the, on the YouTube channel. We got loads of likes for that. Uh, and I really recommend it. It was, it was really a great talk. Um, so, uh, but I'm really excited to, to hear more today. Uh, so as usual, uh, in case this is the first time you've been to the meetup, the format will be uh, a, the talk by Brendan. It's going to be uh, about 40, uh, 50 minutes today. Uh, and then we're going to have a, uh, a QA section, which is going to be um, moderated by Akshay. Um, who's from the University of uh, so the Max Planck Institute at Tubingen, uh, Brendan Lake being from NYU. Um, and so please put your questions into the QA um, function. And then at the end uh, of the of Brendan's talk, we'll, um, we'll read out your questions. Or as usual, put your hand up if you want to ask your question yourself. Um, right now, I'm going to shut up and pass, pass you over to Brendan. Thanks, Brendan. Thank you very much for having me, Martin. Uh, thanks so much for the kind invitation. So I'm gonna to talk to you today about addressing two classic debates in cognitive science with deep learning. Before getting to the research, I wanna highlight some of the people who made this work happen. Amin Oran and Wei-Kin Bong at the top are the two project leaders and Wen Tao, Najung, and Guy have all contributed in important ways to the work I'm gonna tell you about. As we all know, there's been remarkable recent progress in AI. You've all seen the headlines about the latest AI achievements like ChatGPT heralds an intellectual revolution or DALI, the AI that can draw anything. Powering these advances is the transformer arch architecture shown here on the right. And as cognitive scientists, as researchers studying the mind, the brain and machines, we should be truly interested in these developments and what they have to say about us as humans. But what can these AI advances tell us about human learning and development? There are reasons to be skeptical that there's a genuine connection. AI systems are trained in very different ways than people are learn in, in their natural environment. So AI systems are trained in highly unrealistic data, web data for AI compared to natural experience for children. Large language models now train on trillions of words in order to acquire language, as opposed to millions for children over the first few years of life. The web data is not just a matter of quantity, it's also a matter of content. Say you're a model trained on ImageNet, 12% of everything that you see are different images of different dogs. Well, it's way too many dogs to be representative of natural experience. And another, key reason to be skeptical of the connection between these AI systems in our own minds is that AI systems are limited in their abstractions and their generalizations. For these reasons, many researchers, myself included, have been dismissive of these AI advances for telling us much about how the mind works or how children acquire knowledge about the world. But my perspective on this is changing. And let me tell you why. So in this talk, I'm going to tell you about our work in addressing two classic debates in cognitive science with deep learning. Debate number one is about what ingredients do children need to learn words? And debate number two, can neural networks capture human-like systematic generalization? So let's just jump into that first debate. And let's talk about the problem of word learning with an example inspired by W.V. Quine. But imagine you're in a foreign country and this is the scene in front of you, and you hear the word zup. So what does the word zup mean? You can make a, some plausible guesses, but there's a huge number of logically consistent hypotheses. Zup can mean a ball or a big ball or a ball on a carpet or a couch or couch cushions. It could be the time of day. It could be the particular environment that you're in. So this may seem like a contrived situation, but this is how the world really seems to a child learning their first words in language. They hear all these different words or symbols, and they don't know what any of them mean in terms of mapping onto objects in the world. So given the difficulty of this problem, many have wanted to know 
what ingredients do children need to learn words? How do they help narrow their hypothesis base? And there have been many proposals for underlying ingredients and inductive biases. I have a few represented here on the slide, like mutual exclusivity bias, the whole object bias, taxonomic bias, shape bias, joint attention, social cognition, and reasoning. And I love all of this work. Each of these ingredients has support in the literature, but it's hard to discern their relative importance or figure out what is really needed to learn words in the real world. And thus, our plan here is to leave these biases aside for now and ask how far can a learner get with relatively simple domain general learning only applied to a child's natural input? Thus, our plan is to do naturalistic word learning using three minimal ingredients. And these ingredients are slices of one child's longitudinal first person experience with no extra labels, say a baby wearing a head mounted video camera. Ingredient number two is representation learning or feature learning. And ingredient number three is associative learning. So at this point, I, I want, want to clarify that we're going to use the strongest algorithms available to us today in machine learning rather than the most psychologically or neurologically grounded. But in my view, it's not a stretch to assume that whatever we can learn here, the brain can learn better. And the data set we use is called SACAM from Jessica Sullivan and colleagues. It was published in 2021 in Open Mind. We are incredibly grateful for this resource as it made our work possible. We couldn't have done our work without it. And it's a tremendous contribution to science that we and others are only beginning to scratch the surface of. So I suggest you check out this paper if you haven't already. And what's remarkable about this data set is that it's longitudinal audio video recordings over 26 months from three individual children. So it's not head mounted video from a whole bunch of different sources. It's, it's only from three kids, baby S, baby A, and baby Y. And baby S is the one we're gonna focus on who had the most video data. The little clip over there on the right is, is what an example of what it looks like. Near 200 hours of recorded in one to two uh, hour slices uh, per week. And 61 hours of this video has been transcribed. So this is gonna be our main data that we're gonna work with. And now I'm going to tell you about the representation learning piece here, which was covered in work led by Amin Oran, which will appear soon in Nature Machine Intelligence. And here's how we do representation or future learning through the eyes of a child. We're only going to take video from baby S, oh, those slices over two years. And we're going to use a transformer architecture for highly generic learning. By generic, I mean it can be used for state-of-the-art image, text, speech processing, and so on. And the network is going to chop up this image into a bunch of different patches and process them so that there's a single 768-dimensional vector at the top, uh, which is going to represent what occurred in that video frame. The best overall model that I mean trained had 85 million trainable parameters, so substantial, but you know, small by today's standards. And in order to find this architecture, we train 48 different types of models, varying the algorithm architecture and so on. On 750 days of the best GPU uh, compute we have here at NYU uh, in order to settle on this particular version, and some of the architectural details are here. We're only using the static images for now. That's a limitation we can talk about more in the discussion. So here's a high level illustration of how a transformer works. As I said, we're gonna break up these Im the image, the frame into patches here and say, we're gonna focus in on this patch. We're gonna represent it with a vector in isolation. So it only knows what's in this little patch here. And then to produce the next layer of the transformer processing, you'd copy over that vector and then incorporate context from the patch around it, which might help you disambigu disambiguate whether this little fragment uh, occurs as, as part of a hand or as part of an object. And, so. and this just keeps going layer by layer until at the top, you have these highly contextualized pieces of the image and an overall summary. Here's the main self-supervised learning algorithm that we're going to use. It's called Dino. The key principles are that two versions of the same image should have similar representations. And it's self-supervised, so it doesn't need any category labels, no extra supervision that the child wouldn't have access to. So uh, how this works is that we'll take one of those image frames, and then we're going to make two copies of it that 
or two different versions are going to be produced of that image that might be cropped differently or colored differently. And then we present one copy to a copy of the network, which is the student copy, and the other copy is going to go to the copy of the network or the teacher copy. And these two copies of the network are going to try to represent those different views of the image with a similar vector. That's going to be the objective that the network strives for. So this is the same frame. We want it to have a similar representation, and that's the basic idea. And how do we evaluate the system? We're going to use the standard linear probe technique and self-supervised learning. So just from the video frames alone, we're going to train, we're going to learn the features of the visual world. And then we're going to completely freeze those features. So those features can't be adapted in any way for a specific task. Since there's 768 of them, instead we're going to learn a weight for each of those different features. So all we're doing on the top is keeping this frozen feature set, learning a weight for each of them, and then see if we can construct a high-level concept out of those features, like whether we can have a score for detecting a cat in an image would just be a weighted combination of those feature activations. And we want to examine whether the features are useful in a broad sense, and we have a broad range of evaluations, including 26-way classification with uh, categories from the baby head cam data set that were labeled, we have objects segmented from their background, objects in various poses in the background, image net, eco set, place classification, so six different object classification tasks, and also two different semantic segmentation tasks, which require segmenting different object classes from each other at the pixel. But how well can we learn through the eyes of a child? A bird's eye view is shown here on the results on the left. On the y-axis is the normalized score uh, compared to an ImageNet trained model. So what we can do is train the same model in the same way on ImageNet, which is actually a rather strong computer vision baseline model, and see what percentage of the strong ImageNet model can we get by not training on ImageNet, but training just through this baby's eyes. And what we find uh, for the baby trained models here on the left in orange is that you can get about 70% 60 to 70% of the performance of that ImageNet trained model here in pink by training on one of the three different babies in the data set or, or all three babies combined together. And it's similar in performance to a model that's trained on about 10% of ImageNet. So that is, that is the comparison that we're going to make in terms of the quality of the visual features. And it's much better than a model that's trained with that has uh, random features. So here's a breakdown of the individual tasks, which I'm not going to dwell on, but you can look at the breakdown on all eight tasks. And just, just to make an observation is the two black dots for the model trained on baby S and the model trained on 10% of ImageNet are pretty close uh, uh, together across all eight of the different tasks. We also find that common categories can be constructed from these unsupervised features. So if you want to detect a cat and, and you have this cat score, uh, what you can do is take the activation map, this technique called class activation maps, where you, for each of those different features, you can look at where those are features occurred in, in the image as a attention map, and then reweight them depending on how important they are for detecting caps, and then look at what regions of the image the model is paying attention to when it's trying to detect a cap. And by and large, it's you know highlighting, it's paying attention to the re region of the image that contains a cap. It's not perfect. Sometimes you know it, it has um, you know, false positives or includes some of the, the background image around the cat. But it's also quite a capable car detector. Although sometimes it includes you know some of the road or, or the other uh, background around the car. We can also look at the global category structure, which looks largely taxonomic. So here we're looking at the prototype of each ImageNet category projected in a two-dimensional place uh, space using TSNE. And what you'll note is on the left are the living things, and on the right are the artifacts. And here are all those dogs I mentioned that are in ImageNet. We got birds and mammals and other types of, of animals. Now, food is kind of interestingly between animals and artifacts. And then we have a bunch of different artifacts over here. So this makes me wonder um, whether a special taxonomic bias, which is an important bias studied in children's word learning, um, 
around the age of two or three, which is, is the, the age, the oldest of which uh, baby S's data is represented in the data set. It makes me wonder whether you need to build in a special taxonomic bias given the structure of merges from free and the visual things. So now I want to tell you about this associative learning piece, and then we'll move on to the second debate afterwards. This work was led by Waking Bong, which will appear soon in the journal Science. And Wei Qin developed the Child's View for Contrastive Learning, or CVCL model. This, like the representation learner, is another relatively general machine learning algorithm. Here, both uh, it uses both images or frames from the data set uh, that is processed with a vision encoder in order to produce a single vector representing that frame. This is just the same model that we just talked about it in the, the previous article. And there's going to be another encoder here uh, that is going to be the verbal encoder. That's going to encode an utterance spoken to the child and produce that as a vector as well. And the CBCL model is going to try to align you know, visual information with this verbal information. The architecture is very similar to CLIP, if you know about the open AI model from CLIP. And in terms of flagging the limited data, here we're only using 61 hours of video from ABS and their transcripts. So how does the associative learner work? It wants to learn how the visual world corresponds to verbal utterances. So we want to mat represent matching images and utterances with similar vectors and mismatching ones with different vectors. So since this utterance aligned with this frame, we're going to try to represent those vectors as more similar to each other using the cosine similarity metric. And same for this image and this utterance. And then mismatching ones are going to be pushed apart. They, they, um, there's going to be a repulsion force. So if you know uh, the family of losses here in machine learning, we're using the info NCE loss. And note, um, in terms of the connections to the psychology literature, this is the idea of cross-situational learning of words, but at a massive scale from natural experience. So let me tell you about how we evaluate acquired word reference mappings. We're going to use the same set of evaluation images labeled S that I mentioned in the previous project. We're going to take 22 categories here that had sufficient frequency in terms of words that were spoken to the child and construct four-way classification tasks, like the type of vocabulary test that is given to children in the lab, where we, we could give them a prompt like, which one is the ball? And they have to choose the ball amongst the four different objects represented in different images. So here are some of the example categories in the data set, like ball and crib and sand and stairs and so on. In terms of how CBCL is able to answer these questions, it's rather straightforward, and it doesn't need a trained linear decoder, no fine tuning, no strong supervision, only these weak correlations between what's said and what is present in the visual world. The hope is that it's learned the right kind of alignments so that it can actually pick out a ball when the word ball is uttered. So we embed ball with the with the vector for ball, and then we embed each of those candidate frames, and we're going to pick the one that is most similar in terms of the, the vector, and that will be the answer from the model. When we do this, we find that CVCL can learn word reference mappings from real data. So performance here on the y is shown on the y-axis, and the model is able to achieve around 61.6% .6 correct. Now I'm going to put these numbers in context and offer some meaningful upper and lower bounds on performance. In terms of lower bounds, we can compare with a shuffled version of the CBCL model, where now if we reshuffle the utterances so they don't pair with their original frames, uh, the model has no ability to discern what words mean in, in the world and performance is at chance. We can also put in random features rather than those strong self-supervised features from the, the previous article and find that performance uh, is quite a bit worse in terms of the same task. As for upper bounds, we can look at two strong models. We can actually evaluate CLIP from OpenAI, this famous model trained on 400 million image text pairs, um, a lot of web scale data. Now it's not the same, it's not used to seeing child head, head cam data, but um, out of distribution, it performs about the same as the CBCL model on trained on the baby's data, so which we, we thought was, was quite uh, neat. And in terms of a linear probe model, so if we take the approach um, from the previous article and, 
Again, use labeled examples in order to train that linear classifier on top, we can get sort of an upper bound on what's possible if we have unrealistic labeled supervision that the child wouldn't have received themselves. Here are the results broken down by categories. We can look at what words are easier or harder to learn. The easiest words are sand, crib, car, and paper. The hardest ones are toy, basket, room, and hand. We can speculate and talk about in the discussion what makes words easier or harder to learn, just to say it's, it's not dominated by word frequency in, in the corpus, which is interesting. And uh, on CBCL can also learn flexible multimodal representation spaces. So here I'm showing you a TSNE embedding of a large set of frames from uh, Baby Yes's data. And we can inspect individual classes. So shown here in blue are frames that are gold labeled with uh, sand appearing in them. And we can also ask CBCL to pick the 100 frames that it thinks are most likely to contain sand. And you can see that is localized in so the overall space of frames. And um, it's quite accurate. And there's also interesting substructures. There's a cluster over here, which tends to represent sand at the beach. And over here is playing at, with sand in the sandbox. For stairs, again, um, it's there's two different clusters. There's stairs inside, and there's also stairs outside. For puzzle, CBCL predictions are, are again pretty good. And there's the child's favorite puzzle turned out to be this letter puzzle, and that gets its own cluster. And then the other pu puzzles were mixed in down here. So with just one vector per word, uh, we don't just get to represent you know, a single prototype in, in the sense that we talk about it in the cognitive science literature as, as a theory of potential concepts, that we actually can represent multiple subclusters of different related meanings of the word or different representations of the word. And that just emerges for free in a sufficiently complicated neural network. So now let's examine a completely new visual a completely new set of visual exemplars and look at added distribution generalization to, to the set. So we can construct the same types of trials, like which one is the ball, and now use different categories, also from children's early vocabulary, but things like butterfly and bucket and button and spoon with objects segmented from their background, which is very different than the type of data that the model is actually trained on. So performance is, is lower, but it's still meaningful, around 35% correct. And I'm going to zoom in on four different categories that span the, the easiest and the hardest things for the model to pick up. So butterfly and bucket being easier and button and spoon being harder. And it's fascinating to compare the exemplars, CBCL and the child actually got to learn about these words during the training versus the novel exemplars it could generalize to during test. So we can actually look in, in the the child's data set for all the instances of the word butterfly. And there was 23 of them. And it's usually not like real butterflies flying around, which are actually rather hard to see with the camera. But you know, pictures of butterflies in books or in puzzles. And it turns out that the butterflies that the model is best at generalizing to in terms of accuracy, the, the two best are on, on the left columns here, look more like the examples um, in the the that the child had access to than they, the one it generalizes worse to. Or for buckets, the child is typically playing with these colorful toy buckets, but there's some generalization even to these rusty buckets, which tend to populate the data set rather than these child's buckets. Or for buttons, you have a button in a book or a button on a traffic light. Um, the model can pick up more typical buttons, but struggles with more atypical button. Spoons are very difficult, and uh, in part, they're not talked about explicitly as much as you would think, and they're very small in the images, and they're highly uh, overlapping with lots of other categories that occur during the old time. One last thing to tell you about is we can find coherent global structure and alignment across different modalities. So uh, here, uh, what I'm showing is the TSNE embedding of the visual prototypes for those 22 different categories when averaged over the examples of the data set and also their verbal embedding according to the word embeddings that the CBCL model has learned. So green for visual, blue for verbal, if they're highly overlapping, that means it's sort of figured out um, the alignment between that verbal information and the vi visual information. And in a lot of cases for stairs, window, road, and so on, they are tightly overlapping. 
And uh, it turns out the distance in the space is highly predictive of how accurate the model is at making the classification decisions. I could talk more about the, the, the overall structure of these categories um, in the discussion too, if you'd like, and what makes things easier or harder to learn. So let's cover some interim conclusions using head-mounted video recording from a single child, slices of their, their experience over two months, uh, over two years, but really quite limited in terms of the overall amount of information the child actually received. We showed that a deep neural network without strong inductive biases can acquire many word record mappings from just tens of examples, generalize to novel visual reference and achieve multimodal alignment. Thus, a real start on word learning is achievable. But the modeling and the data uh, are still limited compared to a child's experience and capabilities. And to get at truly two-year-old level of word learning, which we're, we're certainly not at yet, uh, more research is, is needed to see uh, what exactly that would take to get there. So now let's move on to the second debate, which is about can neural networks capture human-like systematic generalization? It's been 35 years since Fodor and Polizian's article that launched a lively debate regarding neural nets and compositionality. So as a credit to their foresight, uh, they wrote this article in 1988, but the debate continues today. But here's my restatement in Fodor and of Fodor and Polizian's systematic compositionality. It's the algebraic ability to understand and produce novel combinations from known components. Of course, many others have written about this ability, Chomsky, Montague, Parti, Marcus, and so on. And I'm interested in the behavioral consequences. So I'm gonna give you a demonstration. So say I teach you a new word, like this is how you dax. And when you dax, you like rub the top of your head like, like that, okay? That's how you dax. Now, can you dax twice, dax while jumping, dax wildly around the room? So due to your compositional skills, you can understand and produce the appropriate actions for each of these different instructions. This is an example of systematic compositionality. And Fodor and Polizian argued that neural nets don't have this type of systematicity. They're not good at these abstract rules and generalization, and thus they're not a viable model of the mind. So it was a controversial argument in its day and, and since, but it proved quite prescient because in more recent studies examining do modern neural networks show systematic generalization, some of which I've been involved in, over and over again, the answer turns out to be they're still not systematic after all these years. It seems to be this major limitation for neural network models compared to the human mind. Thus, Marco Baroni and I endeavored to see whether we could unlock latent capabilities in neural networks for systematic generalization. This work was published a couple months ago in nature and, and it's out so you can you can read about the details if you're interested. But in this article, we aim to address the systematicity debate through uh, two key components. Component number one is behavioral studies comparing humans and machines side by side on the same tests. And component number two is a new method for advancing the compositional skills of neural, neural networks through practice, allowing them to match human behavior. So let's jump into those behavioral studies. The DAS, DAS example from a few slides ago suggests people are compositional learners, but that was a thought experiment. And we wanted to collect some, some real empirical data on systematic, systematic generalization uh, with people, which there hasn't been that many studies of. So this is what we came up with. We had people respond to instructions, which were pseudo words with responses that were abstract outputs. So one instruction might be DAX and then the response would be red, uh, that would be the output. Zup is yellow, lug is blue, whiff is green. And then there are some complex instructions like lug, blicket, whiff would be an instruction. And then the output would be blue, green, blue. And whiff, blicket, dax would be the output with the input. And then the output would be green, red, green. So um, in terms of a query now, you get a test question. Uh, what's the answer to Dax Blicket's up? So I'll give you a minute just to think about it. Or if you want to type the answer in the chat, that's also uh, would be great. So what's Dax Blicket's up? What's the, the sequence of colors that would be the right response? See if there's any brave answers if the chat's working.
right? Maybe not. But um, if you guessed red, yellow, red, uh, that's the right answer. And so when you dax blicket zup, first you dax, then you zup, and then you dax again. So blicket's like a function where it's dax is red. So you go red, then you zup, which is yellow, and then you red again, which is dax. And here's the complete study or training set and also the query set. Um, which are provided to participants. So participants uh, learned the primitives, they learned three functions and then compositions of functions, and they were tested on their ability to apply a function to novel input variables and compose functions together in new ways, uh, potentially longer or more, um, more layers of composition they had seen during training. So here's the design of the behavioral study. People learned four primitive instructions. They learned a modifier FEP, which was like thrice, so when you dax fep, you red, 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 or when you lug fep, you blue, blue, blue. Blicket is like surround. We just talked about that one in the demo. And kiki is like after. So when you dax kiki lug, first you with lug, which is blue, and then you dax, which is red. The instructions given to participants were to learn a set of commands and their corresponding outputs. And the outputs are produced by taking colors from this reservoir of different options and dragging them into a box so participants actually had to actively produce those strings which would be the outputs there was curriculum learning so they started with the simpler functions the study set remained visible during the query phase and we ran this on mechanical term here's the overall level of performance in terms of applying a function to novel input variables performance was around 84 percent correct in terms of composing functions together in new ways, performance was about 76% correct. It's worth noting that if you train a sequence to sequence model, like a transformer from scratch on this task, performance is hopelessly bad, like basically at floor at 0% correct, because it doesn't like to use up because it was presented only once during training. And you can see that it participates a lot at test. Note that this is a test that GPT-4 can't do very well either, at least in all my experiments with it. I tried lots of different ways of testing GPT-4 on this task, and the best performance I could get was 59% correct, which is quite a bit below human performance. And it was very fragile in that different orderings, of uh, different ways you ordered the examples led to very different results. So let's zoom in on one of the functions. I uh, hear Dax flick it up, right? This is the one we did together as the demo. So the right answer was dax up dax or red yellow red so 85 percent of participants were able to produce that but a representative mistake was that some a lot of people tried to translate the different words for one by one maybe you you experienced this while you were thinking about it yourself so first they would try to translate dax right which is red and then like oh zup is yellow so i'll put a yellow there and then what's up like it well it's kind of doesn't align to anything directly but maybe i'll grab the green right so maybe that's the, the thought process behind this person who was trying to translate in this one-to-one -one way this is a compositional generalization case so with kiki zup fep in order to handle this let's handle zup fep first so when you zup fep you zup three times or yellow 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 and you need to do that first and then go back and whiff. So when you whiff is, is the green response, right? So 85% of participants got that right, but a representative mistake was to forget to flip the order of the arguments. People like to whiff first because it's written first in the instructions. So they want to do the first thing first and the first and the last thing last, suggesting a type of iconic concatenation bias. So to summarize, we find hints of inductive biases in people's mistakes. There's this one-to-one -one pressure, a single input symbol wraps a single output symbol, and iconic concatenation that the first command is generally dealt with first and, and, and then the second one afterwards. These patterns are also widely attested in natural language in terms of things like the whole object bias or the way we talk about events in the world or what connective words are, are easier for or harder for children to learn. So we can talk about that too as well at the end. So in the second experiment, we wanted to dig into these biases a bit more and see you know, how strong are they. So we developed this open-ended version of the task where we had people try to answer instructions, but we said, just make a guess. We're gonna give you no information about what these instructions mean, besides the fact that you need to respond with these different colored circles. So just guess their outputs. And they got a worksheet here with like zup and zup zup and so on. It turned out that people produced highly structured responses. So 60% of participants responded in exactly the 
a way analogous to this, where they would uh, map one color to one word, and they would respond in a left to right way, and they made sure the colors in the words were unique, which is another bias children use in, in language called mutual exclusivity. So it followed all three of those inductive biases. And um, again, 60% of people responded in this highly structured way to a very unstructured task. In terms of some of the alternatives, here's one participant over here that did just what I said, but actually chose map the number of colors that a word corresponds to to how many syllables were in that word. Or here's a response that is actually rather unstructured, uh, a little harder to interpret. So let's talk about the modeling after I talk to you about the behavioral study and tell you about this new method for advancing the compositional skills. So I want to tell you about meta learning for compositionality or MLC. MLC is a method for advancing the compositional skills of neural networks through practice over a series of episodes. And that practice over different episodes, different mini data sets, is why it makes it meta learning. So in an episode, MLC gets a new word, like a study example. Uh, as a study example, and is asked to use it compositionally in a query. It then compares its output to the target and tries to improve. So in this episode, the new word is skip, and there's some other relevant information in the study examples, like how to jump and how to jump twice. And then the question that's being asked is, how do you skip twice? And you need to extrapolate that based on the information how to skip and also how to do something twice. So all that information is concatenated together and passed both with the query and the study as the source information to a transformer, which then on the output side has to actually produce the right actions to skip twice. And the next episode comes along with another new word like to tiptoe. And the question is tiptoe backwards around the cone and the model has to produce that compositional generalization and updates and so on. So that's the basic idea. So what does MLC look like for a few shot instruction learning? Well, here, the meta learning proceeds over a series of compositional tasks, each with a different latent grammar. So the task that we all talked about together and the participants did have a latent grammar behind it. And to train the model, it gets one episode where it gets a bunch of different study instructions and their outputs, and it gets some queries. It does its best to answer the queries. You know, it it uh, gets corrections and then it moves on to the next episode, which has different. Now the, the words mean different things and there's a different set of queries and it needs to try to figure out what they mean, how to respond compositionally and so on. So constantly training its compositional skills. And there's a latent grammar that defines each of the episodes that the model never has access to, right? But it is sort of the, the gold uh, standard for um, what it's trying to mimic. And that those are all uh, generated automatically. So the targets of the queries are usually based on these algebraic grammars, but sometimes we swap in the inductive bias responses that participants make when they were making mistakes and see if this model can mimic human-like systematic compositionality. The caveat is that we're modeling adult compositional skills at the behavioral level. We're not modeling at the acquisition level. So we're not claiming that this process of training the model uh, mirrors how adults come to these skills necessarily. So after meta-learning, how do we evaluate the model? What we could do is give it a question like Dax Book It's Up, which is the one we did together as the demo, and the relevant study information, like the same study information that participants got, and then ask it to try to answer that question, right, by producing the right series of outputs. So if it's successful, with just frozen weights, so the transformer is not allowed to update its, its weights at all um, when at test time. So just with its attention and, and its memory, it's going to see if it could quickly learn new rules or infer rules and compose these rules together algebraically uh, in order to answer one of these compositional queries. And then also prefer the types of input-output regularities and meaning that people do. So how do people in MLC compare? After meta-learning, MLC's most likely outputs are perfectly systematic, 100% consistent with the graph. With stochastic sampling over possible outputs, the accuracy of the MLC model and people are quite close to each other. For predicting human responses, both in terms of when they got it right, but also when they got it wrong, the best way to do that is to look at the log likelihood of the participants' data given the model. So larger numbers here are better, and MLC outperforms a number of different baselines. 
including a standard neural network not trained with meta learning, a symbolic model that has access to the gold grammar or a gold grammar model where also we've engineered the human inductive biases as well in a similar way to, to MLC still isn't as good to the MLC model um, in terms of predicting the details of the human behavior. And just to give you some examples, so this, this was the, the question again, Dax book, it's up. 21 participants uh, here produced the right answer. And some of the errors are one-to-one uh, uh, one to one errors, right? Trying to translate the, the tokens one by one. So MLC, again, the majority are the right answer. And it also makes one-to-one -one errors that are a lot like the human ones. For Zup, Kiki, Dax, again, the majority is uh, the, the right answer. But sometimes people reverse the order. They had that icon, icon concat concatenation mistake. And again, the model does the same thing. And here's, uh, I'll just flash up a, a more complicated question where, where the model, um, you know, again, uh, produces responses that, that look quite human-like in, in both the successes and the mistakes. So next up is the open-ended instruction task where we gave participants this blank worksheet and said, just try to guess what these words mean, right? And the model can also be trained on some examples of human worksheets and then ask it to fill in this one of these blank worksheets for a new task with no direct directly relevant experience. It can go through and it can guess the zups up and then feed that back and guess what zup means and so on and sort of fill out that worksheet. And when you do that, it 65% of the samples recreate the modal human response pattern for people, which was about 60% of people did that. You can compare how it does on each of the different proportions of inductive biases. And again, in terms of log likelihood, it's the best account of the human data compared to a range of different models that we tested. And I'll, I'll, I'll skip through this, but you know, can produce very structured responses and also some less structured responses that um, have some of them biases, but not all. We can also apply the same basic idea to machine learning benchmarks, where we use meta learning to, to learn how to quickly pick up a new mapping and use it compositionally. This relates to the scan benchmark that I developed also with Marco Baroni, where the key idea is that jump is a new word that you've just added to your vocabulary and you're asked how to jump twice, right? Um, and you have some relevant other experience for how to run twice, how to walk twice, how to look twice, and so on. So we can create meta-learning episodes where the meaning of the words is a constantly changing in every episode. And, and thus it learns to quickly infer the meaning of a word and use it compositionally. And when we do this, in, in much the same way uh, the, the model was applied to previous tasks, we can get dramatic improvements in the error rate on these benchmarks. So here it's showing the error rate now where smaller is better. And on three different splits of scan, uh, we can get gains in terms of the error rate up to like 400% or 1,000% depending on the different splits for, for uh, that challenge. And also COGS, which is a challenge not developed by us, uh, but is about semantic parsing, trying to get the meaning of sentences and introduce new words and new concepts from just a single example, we can get a seven-fold um, decrease in the error. So let's step back and look at where we are in terms of limitations and open questions. MLC allows neural networks to do few-shot induction of primitives and functions and compose them together in flexible and algebraic ways. But not just that, it can also prefer hypotheses that capture certain input-output regularities as meaning, like the different inductive biases that we observed in the human data. So in that sense, it's, it's quite successful at modeling adult compositional skills, both in its successes in terms of what previous neural networks couldn't do, but also its failures in terms of cases where people stray from systematic generalization. But future work will need to address how can a model learn entirely new primitives rather than new primitive mappings. The model does need exposure to all the different symbols that are possible, and we can talk about ways of, of uh, overcoming that limitation in the discussion if you'd like. Also, how do these models develop compositional skills on more realistic experience? Can MLC succeed with natural word learning experience, like the type of SACAM head-mounted video data? Could we apply these techniques there to understand how children learn words so quickly or where our compositional skills come from? To wrap up, we talked about two classic debates, and let's summarize what we learned about them. So in debate one, 
What ingredients do children need to learn words? From slices of one child's egocentric data over that two year period, relatively generic neural networks can make genuine pr progress on the naturalistic word learning problem. And it may be the case that stronger inductive biases play a role in children's smart inferences and more advanced word learning. There's a lot of empirical evidence for that as well. But those biases may not be essential for making real progress in terms of learning words out in the world. And in debate number two, can standard neural networks capture human-like systematic generalization? Yes, they can with, if you give them the right kind of practice, if they hone their ability to make systematic generalizations. So in empirical studies, people were highly systematic, although they relied on inductive biases that sometimes helped them and also could sometimes hinder them or read them in mistakes. And model but comparisons, only MLC could achieve this flexibility in terms of making both bias based responses, and also highly systematic responses. And it shows a path forward for advancing the compositional skills of neural networks in a general purpose learning driven way. So with that, I'd like to thank our team, thank the SACAM data set, and thank you very much for listening. Thanks so much, Brendan. Very, very lovely talk again. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Akshay in a minute uh, to handle the QA. Uh, and please uh, let me uh, urge uh, audience to please put your questions again into the QA section uh, so that actually I can ask them or just to, as, as a reminder if you put your hand up then we will unmute you so that you can ask your own question and um, obviously we prefer that you ask your own question so I think there's one question coming in actually but uh, over to you now and uh, one, one second Lawrence I've got Lawrence right and Knight you've raised your hand but could you put your question into the uh, QA and also raise your hand just so that we can we can properly log the questions. Um, I, actually, may, maybe it would be easier if we just change that. I was thinking it might be easier if we just change that and just allow Lawrence to ask his question directly. Um, actually, if that's, if, that's, if that's okay with you. No. Uh, let me just try and figure out how to uh, unmute Lawrence. <laughs> Sorry, two seconds, Lawrence. I'm going to be with you in a second. Okay, you, you are muted. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Great, cool. Oh, hi then. Um, so thanks so much for the talk. It was it was super interesting. Um, I'm I'm an applied data scientist who's just started kind of getting it a little bit interested in in sort of AGI theory and 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 I've just been reading a little bit about world models. Um, so so my current thinking is and it's not particularly well informed is is that without a world model. Um, sort of likely learn through a process um, like sensory motor learning um, that, uh, that, that that would then create sort of strong notions of of kind of you know inherent learn notions of things like objecthood. Um, artificial systems would probably won't be able to learn sort of language that would be comparable to to kind of human level language. Um, and I just thought I just wondered if you had any kind of comments or, or thoughts around this. Thank you very much, Lawrence. That's a great question. So I, I think the the question is is getting at something which is exactly right. Uh, with this approach, you're going to miss a tremendous amount about a, a child's understanding of the world. And in a related way, their understanding of what many words mean, right? Um, there's all these words like, you know, are you hungry? Um, or it was something spicy or like banana or whatever that are really relevant the child like wants to learn about because it means something to them. Like it matters, right? They have they they may or may not like like to eat something spicy. They may they they want the banana, right? So there there's there's um all these things that are gonna be missed because uh, the model only has these two sensory modalities. It doesn't actually have wants. Um, it doesn't have control of the way it's it's acting in the world. Uh, uh, so this approach uh, is generic in terms of using generic neural networks trained on this visual language experience, I think brings a lot of insight to this particular debate. Like, do we need, what priors do we need in place in order to get word learning going? And what 
really surprised me about this this result was like you can get going without much more than that, right? You really, um, even from just a few examples in the child's data set, uh, you could make some real progress on word learning. That doesn't mean you can learn a uh, uh, far from it, uh, the the set of things that you know a one and a half year old or two year old is is going to be capable of learning. So I think ultimately, we want to build a full cognitive model. Uh, we're going to need something more like a world model. And there's something else you mentioned in your question that the notion of object representation, which uh, I think is is sort of exactly the thing that this type of model is going to struggle with. Right? I showed you some examples of it, including the the road in its constant in its attention when trying to categorize cars or the cat, it was looking at the cat, but also the cat's favorite spot on the couch. So it doesn't differentiate those things in as clean a way as you know we we would as people because we we have these notions of these much more robust notions of objects. And we've also seen that in in like generative models that we train on this data set, which can make some compelling looking frame like fake headcam frames that look like the, the same types of data the child might have seen. But if you look carefully, the objects kind of go in and out of existence and they sometimes emerge together in unrealistic ways. So I think that's kind of exactly the type of thing that is going to be the weak place in these models. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, thanks for the great talk, uh, Bryn. So maybe I will take one of the questions from the Q&A and then maybe on top of that, ask a couple of questions uh, that came to my mind during the talk. Sure. So I think one of the thing, uh, I'll paraphrase uh, the question from Oze. He says that maybe the type of mistakes people do depends on the kind of experiences they've had and so on. Like, for example, he says that a computer scientist or linguist would be less prone to make the concatenation bias uh, than others. Uh, and he was asking, basically, he or she was asking, basically, if you can take into account these factors and did you see that in your, in your data set? Yes, yeah, uh, very interesting question. We, uh, we we didn't collect detailed data about you know occupation and programming experience and whether they're a linguist and, and all that. You know, I imagine I imagined the chances are, um, you know, we didn't have too many folks trained in formal linguistics on the AMT sample. Uh, but I think your question is really interesting, and and uh, and we should look into that with a bigger sample and uh, getting more background on the participants. I mean, there, there's a fair amount of variability. Uh, it, it, you know, some participants performed quite well, others uh, were much more sort of bias-based in their responses. And the MLC model is like trying to model all of them in aggregate, right? It's, uh, it produces you know, the right answer roughly in, in, in the levels of people um, in aggregate and it makes mistakes at the, the same types of mistakes at roughly the same ratios as people in aggregate, but it's not individuated. So another really interesting facet of your question is, you know, can we go beyond just showing that the model can act like this aggregate person in principle and figure out like what the details would look like, whether we can model those individual differences. Uh, but, but what I think is really exciting about this approach is that it shows the ability to span that spectrum between highly systematic and Highly heuristic and bias driven, right? The, the same model can can uh, do both, um, and this part of the the power of, of meta learning is that you can incorporate a lot of different types of priors that aren't so easy to incorporate using other approaches. So I think it's the right tool to study it. We just uh, would we need to expand our work there. Um, so yeah, I think uh, Martin had a question. Maybe after that, maybe I can follow up ask another question. I had. Oh, oh thanks, thanks, Ashay. Um, you know, friend, I. So I, I've got this kind of um, this idea. I don't know whether it's true, but I feel like humans, when they do the kind of task that you're talking about, they they either get it or they don't. The, the, uh, either they know what Kiki means or, or they don't. So you're going to see like really strong correlation between the individual predictions of an individual person. Um, like like the, the, once once they once they grasp it, they're just going to get it right all of the time, and they're basically never going to make yeah. a mistake. Did, did you were you able to look at that to ask whether the MLC chain models also had that characteristic or, or or not? We we could we could try to model that. Um, we we didn't. That's not the way we were you know doing the modeling here uh, precisely. But I, like one way you can start with that is to um, 
you, you know, have an answer or query, and then whatever the answer is, feed that back as like the study uh, and say, okay, like, you know, like you committed to that answer, right? Like now, now what's your next one? So that would lead this, this sort of cascade of reasoning. And it, it's certainly the case that, you know, some, some people really got it. It's not the case that it, it was completely bimodal, right? Um, on the harder functions with more compositions that were demanded more reasoning, there was cases where people could get the simple cases where break down the more complicated ones, right? So I think there's, there is more to the story than just getting it or not. Mm -hmm. uh, but th there's there's also this really uh, interesting latent idea here that in, in order to explain that type of phenomenon, um, there's this popular idea in psychology, right? That there's these two systems, right? Um, you have your intuitive system, which is kind of doing like the more gut-based heuristic biased response. And then you have your more um, systematic uh, deductive logical reasoning um, system too, that um, is looking for that, dis that more discrete hypothesis and maybe finds it, maybe doesn't, right? Uh, but that's traditionally thought of, there's only the two different models like acting independently from each other. And, um, you either get it or you go with go with your gut, uh, but is uh, just the fact that like that's present in the data. This this model also produces both, both types of reasoning with the same architecture, and um, without any um, <laughs> special training for one versus the other, right? So so I, I do think it it could have some potential implications for for like how that happens in the mind as well. And do we really need two systems or not? Uh, I, I I think uh, that'll also be something we could take up in the future. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Ben. So I think maybe as a follow-up to that, uh, and in general for your talk, I was just thinking, having, um, I mean, kind of uh, portrayed like both of these debates, I was just wondering, what is your thoughts on what are the ingredients needed uh, to kind of get to like a more broader set of, uh, not just this model, but across multiple tasks, is what do you think are needed apart from meta learning, for example, curriculum learning is something, that we see influences, for example, in adults, how people learn. Also, you mentioned like contrastive learning is one like kind of block loss function that you can learn to learn representations like people. Maybe are there more general objectives that we can take into account or in terms of architecture, is there something still missing or do you think transformers uh, is like good enough and so on. So what are your current thoughts on what are the other things that we need to build in going towards your vision that you portrayed in your BBS article on building machines that think and act like people? Yes, yes, yeah, great, great question. And, and you know, the, it's not, these stories are not necessarily perfectly in sync with each other, right? Like that, that is, um, they're proposing what are, you know, these key cog ingredients that we ultimately need to build a full model that learns and thinks like people do. Yeah. Um, but, you know, since then have also been taken by the progress you can make, um, without all those ingredients in place as well. And I still believe you ultimately need them to get all the way there, but maybe um, you can get quite a bit further than we thought using today's tools and um, the incredibly rich data that children have access to. So yes, I, mean, I do think like there's gonna be benefits to building a world model and object representations and agent representations. If you wanna le learn the full breadth of the, of the words and concepts that we know and how, how we understand the word, the, the world uh, works, but that's not um, the only approach to, to take in order to make more real progress in, in figuring out where our knowledge really comes from. Because I think there's a number of places where the ingredients we have here, or even just the data and the learning we have here is much too limited compared to what children actually have access to. And this approach, um, this more, data-driven approach could go much further as well. So I have one then kitten slide here somewhere. Oh yeah, okay. Um, in terms of like ways that this, this CBCL model and self-supervised learning approach is limited uh, compared to kids, they have without adding those ingredients. There's no taste, touch, and smell. The sound was transcribed. The videos were only using the stills. We're not using the true video information, which could really help with a lot. And that's the direction we're doing now. Um, the network is only passive, it's not allowed to act in the world, they have no social cognition, no joint attention, it doesn't have wants, 
I didn't realize that language is a means of achieving once. So given we can get this far with just this, um, which is very limited in terms of the amount of data, the richness of the data, the modalities, and also the other abilities that it connects to, um, I want to know how much further we can go as well uh, by, by pushing in both those directions, the more top down, but also applying today's machine learning with a cognitive twist to the real data that you'll have got. I see. Really good answer, actually. I mean, one question I had, like, just as a follow up to this, was there are like models which uh, have issues when you train it on like continuous videos, which are not identically ind independently sampled. For example, if you give a video frame, like a continuous video where like each frame are correlated with each other, the current models a bit struggle in terms of learning good representations in this. Uh, and in your case, I think contrastive learning kind of solves the problem, but you still take stills of the image and then you do that, right? But maybe if you go to videos, maybe these are some of the technical challenges that one has to solve. Uh, so I was just wondering, what's your take on that? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, um, you know, these predicting the future works much better for text than it does for video. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And you know, I mean, has been working on this with um, various generative models that can produce you know multiple frames in the future or filling in gaps in frames and using some you know as a standard. Uh, video modeling techniques that are, are currently out there. And, you know, they 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 definitely learned interesting structure for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but also as alluding to, they, they, there's real issues, at least with the technology we have in learning something like objects that are physically valid <laughs> and don't do crazy things yeah. and don't merge with other things. Mm -hmm. That doesn't seem to come from the techniques we have and the amount of data that's mm -hmm. represented here. But you know, how much is that needed? Would is a prior really needed much stronger constraints, or how much of what's listed on this slide would help explain that gap? I don't know yet. I see. Yeah, like I think this definitely like this meta learning and using this for a framework for studying cognition is something that's opened up now as a new framework for studying human behavior. So I guess these are all the open questions that comes about that we probably in the coming years can answer. Um, cool. Oh, so, and yeah, I guess. Yeah. We need your help too, yes. <laughs> yeah, well, we would be love to happy to collaborate in the future. Maybe we should talk offline. Uh, sure. But yeah, I guess we're running out of time. Uh, so it's 8.30 already, but uh, so thanks a lot, Ben, for giving this great talk. Uh, really nice to see how far you've come from the original building machines that think and act like people, and now your framework is developing over time. So it's really exciting to see how it goes forward in the coming years. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. And th th thanks, Brendan, for a fantastic talk uh, and a lovely discussion. Uh, sorry to draw it to a close. Uh, I, I know we could we, we could run around, but but um, please uh, do check out the uh, YouTube channel. It's London Machine Learning on YouTube, uh, and subscribe. And this this um, talk will be posted like all of them um, within a couple of days. Thanks so much again, Brendan and Akshay, and thanks to the audience. And see you next time.